It was five years ago when the Arcadia Empire, after under a tyrannical rule for centuries, finally fell. What did the Empire in was a coup d'etat, led by a mysterious rider in a black machine dragon. He wielded his dragon with such brutal skill that he managed to dominate anyone who dared come near him. To this day, his true identity is still unknown to many, but his very mythos invokes a certain fear and respect in the people that they continue to pass down the heroic tale of this drag knight. He is called the Black Hero. After the fall of the Empire, it is now called the Kingdom of Astemara. Not far from it is the Crossfeed City Fortress. Somewhere in a cold little cellar, Lux Arcadia finds himself in a tight position after being taken as a prisoner there. See, he was chasing after a cat that stole a girl's purse, but he stepped on the rooftop of the girl's bathroom making him fall through. To the surprise of absolutely no one in the audience, he landed on top of a certain blonde girl, putting them in a compromising position. While the boy is terrified by this development, the girl was seething. With a sardonic smile, she asked him if he has any last words. This made poor Lux panic even more, and he decides to talk his way out of it. Luckily for him, he remembers that the old man from his previous job said that girls love to be complimented. So our boy here gave the girl a good look with an innocent golden retriever smile. He then told her something to the tune of, you're cute and have a childlike body. And for some extra flavor, he also added, you're a total knockout. Mm -hmm. Terrible idea. All the girls there started screaming and now Luxie Boy is left to lament his fate there in the cellar. He also has another work order today. Just then, Crucifer visits the young prisoner and analyzes his weapon. She finds it unusual for someone to carry two sword devices, especially the black one. When she brings up the black sword, Lux looks away, as if uncomfortable with the topic. Meanwhile, Shalice interrupts them to inform Lux that he's being summoned by the Academy's headmistress. Headmistress? Oh, they're in an academy. So why is there a cellar there? Okay, never mind. She and another student, Tilfer Lilmet, accompany him there. Once in the office, Headmistress Relly welcomes Lux to Royal Knight Academy, a school where drag knights are trained to be on par with the military forces of other countries. Since girls are said to have a higher aptitude for being drag knights, the academy is actually an all-girls school. She regards them as Lux Arcadia, the former prince of the Arcadia Empire, and the boy apologizes for causing a ruckus. The headmistress lets him get off easy, since they were the ones who summoned him for a job. Besides, she's a long-time acquaintance of his, so she knows that he's too gutless to be creeping on girls. Anyway, Lux is there because the headmistress wants him to work for them. Everyone's taken aback by this. What part of all girls school isn't clicking with the headmistress? In her defense, she explains that after the coup d'etat happened, there are only a few male drag knights left. As such, boys like him are valuable. Besides, those two swords aren't just for show, you know. But before he could even respond, the door bursts open with cries of objection. The source? Why, it's the blondie he landed on earlier. She protests that she won't accept a perv like him in their institution, and the other girls rally behind her. They're all terrified of Lux, who's now known as the perv who fell from the sky. Instead of, well, vouching for his innocence like she promised to, the headmistress just smiles and let Lisa Shart or Alicia decide Lux's punishment since she's the victim. Smirking, Lisha challenges Lux to fight her so she can determine if he's worthy of becoming a drag knight in their academy. This has the other girls excited, and they're all rooting for Lisha. Everyone's confident that she can easily beat him, but the headmistress begs to differ. After all, Lux won the prize money in the Royal Capital Tournament. To this day, he remains undefeated. That's why they call him the weakest undefeated. This does little to dissuade Lisha, and she even takes offense in the fact that a pervert like him is undefeated in anything. She won't allow that, so she pulls out her sword and challenges him to a one-on-one -on -one duel with their machine dragons. If he loses, he'll be jailed as a criminal. But if Lux wins, he'll be acquitted and be able to work in the academy. Leisha provokes him even more by telling everyone to announce that there will be an exhibition of the New Kingdom's princess crushing the former Empire's prince. Lux is pretty shocked, because the very girl challenging him is Lisa Shard Adismata, the first princess of the kingdom that destroyed Lux's empire. Poor Lux can only scream in disbelief, but after some time, Lux goes to his sister, Irie, to apologize for causing such a commotion in her school. 
They also have Iris' stoic roommate, Noct Leaflet, with them, but she's careful not to get too close to Lux. The perverse allegations reached even Noct here, and she heard that he can lift skirts with just his breath if a girl gets too close to him. Oh dear. As for Irie, she's worried about how she'll pay for their debts if Lux loses the tournament. Since they're surviving members of the former Imperial family, their Cardia siblings have been branded as criminals. They had to borrow money to gain amnesty, so if Lux gets jailed for his misbehavior, Irie won't be able to pay for it by herself. What's more is that the siblings are made to don black collars that denoted their statuses in the kingdom. But at the end of the day, even if Leech is the undefeated knight in their academy, Lux is unbeatable too. If anything, it'll be a fair fight. The day of the battle arrives and the tension is palpable. Leisha promises Lux that she'll tell him why she wants to fight him if he wins. For the moment, Lux summons his wyvern, but is caught off guard as Leisha showcases her divine raiment, Machine Dragon, Tiamat, which is on an entirely different level from the generic machine Lux is using. Sadly, it's the perks of being in the royal family you just don't have any more Lux. Irie notes that Tiamat is a rare and ancient weapon that only the strongest can use. Lux's generic dragons just no match against it. The battle finally commences, and Leisha is dead set on winning this duel. She fires her bullets, but Lux manages to dodge them. Then Leisha creates a diversion to hit Lux with a powerful shot, but he has shielded himself with his sword, which gets sliced in half. While maintaining his soft and polite demeanor, he asks Leisha, if we keep going like this and the match ends with a draw, can't we work things out? Looks like our prince is confident about this draw. Once more, he apologizes for what happened in the bathroom, but his words do nothing to quell Leisha's anger. In fact, she even calls him the King of Fools for thinking that she'd let that slide. She then eggs him on, demanding that he use his black sword, but Lux refuses, which only offends the girl further. Enraged, Leisha sees her opening and fires powerful energy that can instantly vaporize anyone, called the Seven Heads. The spectators marvel at this addition to Leisha's dragon, but also wonder if they should be there with how the fight is going. Luckily for him, Lux manages to avoid it again. The instructors must redeploy the safety barrier because Leisha penetrated through it. They commend Leisha's effort to at least avoid the spectators. Nog predicts that Lux will lose this fight at this rate. Irie agrees and asks that he ask for it, but she says that even if her brother's like that, there's still one good thing about him. Once he's decided about something, he'll follow through with it. Now let's go back to the fight. Not satisfied with how Lux can easily dodge her attacks, she harnesses all the power Tiamat can and releases his divine raiment mode. This is a power so strong it can control gravity. Lux is pushed back to the ground, leaving him helpless. This is the perfect time for Leisha's killing shot, but she unexpectedly loses control of the Divine Raiment. Lux then tells her to get out of Tiamat, but she's still set on winning. Cause look, she has that crazed look in her eyes. Yikes. However, that's no longer the real problem, as an abyss suddenly appears in the arena. This is unusual as these creatures come from the ruins, Irie remarks. So why is it here? All civilians are instructed to evacuate the area. Wyverns are asked to create a barrier to protect the school from the monster. While all of this is going on, Lux asks Leisha a favor. It may seem foolish and nonsensical, but he requests her to land and fire the seven heads at the abyss once he raises his sword over his head. Leisha is confused about what a broken sword can do, but decides to go with the plan as everyone is in danger. While they, or Lux really, strategize, Irie and Noct stay in the arena and watch the two fight the Abyss. As members of the school's triad, Chalice and Tilfer reprimand Irie for not evacuating, and Noct for just standing there. She's also a triad for Pete's sake. Sure, she says, but look at Irie's older brother. And so we do. Lux has started a game of chase with the Abyss until he sees an opening to raise his sword. The Abyss quickly swerves him with his claws, but Leisha is quick to catch this and fires Seven Heads' fatal blow. The monster perishes, and the Academy is safe from chaos. Yay! She lands back on the ground and sees Lux's wyvern crumple to the ground. She gets off a Tiamat and runs to him. Some time later, as Leisha cleans herself, she can't help but think about how Lux intentionally took the enemy's attack to create a diversion. It's the first time a man has ever tried to help and protect her. Meanwhile, Lux is dreaming of his past with the man holding the black sword he has now. He immediately jolts awake. He then sees Leisha carrying a bowl of warm water and a face towel. 
The girl admits that she's grateful for him protecting them from the abyss, even though he was just using a mere wyvern. Lux, in turn, says that it feels it's just something he has to do. As promised, Leisha shares why she's so keen on challenging him. It's because Lux has seen something on her in the bathroom. It isn't her body itself, but the symbol embedded on it. And that symbol is the crest of the former empire. However, she can't disclose the reason why she has one. Leisha makes Lux promise not to tell anyone about the crest, which he agrees to. He even swears this on his two sword devices. Speaking of which, Leisha wants to know why Lux refuses to use his black sword, but that's not something he wants to talk about. Before leaving, Leisha informs Lux that he is accepted into the academy, but his work for the headmistress is cancelled. Instead, he'll come to school as a royal knight cadet. Unfortunately, there isn't any room for Lux to complain, seeing as it is the princess's orders. And with that, Leisha happily tells him to call him by her nickname, Leisha, just as her classmates would. Meanwhile, Crucifer is secretly listening to their conversation. The following day, Lux is introduced in front of the class, but he barely needs any introduction as he's gained a bit of fame from defeating the monster. When it's time for him to take his seat, the boy is taken aback to see a familiar face. It's Filofi, an old friend of his. Since he's new, Lux asks Filofi if they can share textbooks. Filofi ignores this and reminds him how he used to call her Fichang. Though Lux is a bit embarrassed since they're too old for those nicknames, he still calls her by her nickname. In return, she calls him Lucha. The class hears about this and are endeared by the two, while a certain someone, <coughs> Princess Leisha, <coughs> is getting jealous. But damn, all this is too much for little Lux. He went from being public enemy number one to being a total ladies' man. He has no clue why all of these girls are lining up to set schedules with him. Cause like suddenly they all need help with something. What's more surprising is Leisha unexpectedly asks him to be her exclusive personal assistant. Fee butts in and tells the princess she's making Lux uncomfortable. Try as Leisha may to bribe her with a donut, Fee still opposes this. To prevent any further commotion from brewing, Crucifer takes Lux away under the guise of the headmistress asking for him. Lux is pretty grateful that she's helping him out, but Crucifer has an agenda of her own. The black hero, the mysterious conqueror, the man who, despite bringing an entire empire to ruin, remains unknown to all. She wants Lux to find him, as Crucifer has unfinished business with the black hero. While she's talking, a perturbed look crosses Lux's face. He doesn't say anything, but it's as if the conversation pains him. In a dark dungeon illuminated by a single lamp, a troubled Lux is speaking with a cloaked man. About the human experimentation the Imperial Army has been performing, your childhood friend is now on the list. The man, Fugil, says, We have no choice but to kill them. Lux seems to begrudgingly accept this, but as his downcast gaze falls on his black sword, he says that he wants to lessen the casualties as much as possible. Fugil smiles, and Lux wakes up. It's just another dream. The boy closes his eyes again and squeezes something soft. Uh ha ha, spoiler alert folks, it's not a blanket. It's actually Fee's, you know, jug. He's in bed with Fee. How did he get there? This wakes Lux fully, and he frantically asks her what she's doing there. The girl's a lot more casual about it than he is, and while rubbing her eyes, she tells him that it's her room and that she just missed sleeping with him. Okay, sure. But Lux insists that she should still cover herself, because he can see everything. Tilford then suddenly opens the door to try and wake Fee, but after seeing the two, she promptly closes it. Being the walking speaker, Tilford instantly spreads the rumor like wildfire. Now in the cafeteria, Irie expresses her disappointment in Lux's lewd actions. Not even a week in and he's already sleeping in a girl's room. Lux tries to explain himself as he just slept in his assigned room. He wasn't even aware that Fee is his roommate. He tried protesting against this arrangement to the headmistress, but she just told him to take care of her younger sister. And yup, the headmistress and Fee are siblings. You know, notice the hair? Irie then bids him farewell soon enough, with Nox still in tow. But Lux is disappointed, since he wants to have breakfast with her. But Irie sadly admits that if she stays with him any longer, she won't be able to leave his side. Aw, so sweet. But she then says that it's a joke before reminding him to be careful about the matter. They discuss. The camera then focuses on his mysterious black sword as he solemnly says that he will. 
Later that day, Lux enters the mechanic's cabin and to his surprise, Leash is there. She actually repaired his wyvern so he could join the school's night squadron, a special unit of students with promising abilities. Leisha saw exceptional qualities within him, so she is happy to welcome him into the team. Taking the chance of spending more time with Lux, Leisha invites him for lunch under the guise of another job order. It's going to be perfect, but she forgot her wallet, unfortunately. Instead, Lux treats her with delicious pastries, which makes her heart flutter. The girl mentions this fluttering thing to Lux, which makes the dense boy worry. She assures him that she only needs to rest. And lucky for her, Lux has the perfect place for just that. Lux brings her to the top of the bell tower, where Leisha can let loose, air out her troubles, and breathe some fresh air. He worked as a handyman and cleaned that place before, hence why he knows it. Leisha grows intrigued at the prospect of a handyman prince. Lux then tells her that he admires just how knowledgeable she is in repairing and upgrading machines. What's more is that she's a first-class drag knight. She's truly an amazing princess all around. The words have evoked something within Leisha, and the girl turns serious. She asks Lux what it means to be a princess. She reminds him of the former Empire's crest on her body, symbolizing her captivity. Apparently, she was held hostage to stop her father from doing the coup d'etat, but the coup pushed through anyway. She was abandoned. This deeply hurt Leisha, as she wanted her dad to rescue her, choose her and not the country. But he didn't. So when her dad died, she had no choice but to reign as the new kingdom's princess. She's not fit for the position, but she's a surviving member of the House Arismata. She doesn't have a choice. And with all that said, she asks Lux if it wasn't difficult for him to lose his position as the Empire's prince. Now back in the common room, Lux falls into his thoughts again as a vision of his brother resurfaces. The castle is filled with lifeless bodies. Lux cries as they ask his brother why he killed all of them. Why? The plan was to minimize the casualties. What happened to that? Fugil just laughs at him, telling him he was useful. If he didn't kill him, they would have killed him. Fugil watches his little brother cry, and he tells him that he will never be king, for he is the weakest. Lux suddenly wakes up and hears the bell of the tower ringing. What's happening? Apparently, Another abyss has been caught wandering the fortress. Now, as members of the squadron, it is their duty to help the drag knights protect the kingdom. This incident leaves a bitter taste in Lux's mouth, as the constant appearance of the abysses is no longer normal. The squadron reaches the slimy monster and prepares to shoot it in unison, but they are interrupted by a whistling sound. In the academy, Fee tells Lux that she can hear something. She can hear the sound of a whistle. Now back to the slime, the creature suddenly explodes and out of it comes multiple gargoyles. A man leads this abyss army and introduces himself as Ragreed Forrest, captain of the Imperial Guard Knight Squadron of the Arcadian Empire. Another whistling sound and the gargoyles aggressively attack. Calling for backup, Nock returns to their base. Lux immediately volunteers to go after them, despite him using an ordinary wyvern. Irie worries about him because of this. He can't use his other sword, too. But he only tells her not to worry. He won't leave her alone in this world. Leisha does her best to take offense back into the battlefield, but all her comrades are injured. They have no choice but to retreat. However, Leisha is eager to destroy whatever tool Ragreed uses to control the Abyss. Unfortunately, she is instantly cornered by the rebel army. Leisha cries in despair because no matter what she does, she can't do anything befitting a princess. She can't even protect their kingdom. Ragri takes a laugh at this and tears Leisha's clothes. He smirks at the sight of the crest and reminds Leisha that he's the one who put it there. She belongs to him. The horrendous memory flashes to Leisha's eyes, and she instantly throws her sword at him, giving him a cut on the cheek. Furious, Ragri is determined to end Leisha's life when Lux suddenly comes to her rescue. Lux tells Leisha that he has failed to be a prince many times. He cannot save everyone, but he swears to do his best because he wants to be recognized by the kingdom's princess. Lux then removes the wyvern and grabs his black sword. With whatever it's worth, Lux summons Bahamut, and Ragreed cannot mistake it. The black hero stands before him. The black hero then slays every single gargoyle on his way, like a bunch of fireworks exploding in midair. Ragreed cannot believe that the black hero, who has single-handedly destroyed 1,200 of the Empire's machine dragons, and the traitor who went against them during the war is their seventh prince himself. 
Enraged with such treachery, Ragraid attacks mindlessly while Lux reinforces his powerful attack by burning him into ashes. My brother is not a hero, Irie thinks. He is the undefeated Bahamut Drag Knight who destroyed their empire. Cue the theme song! And that's it folks, we're done with today's recap. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Just kidding. Now the following day, Lux is surprised by the Academy as his comrades prepare a delicious feat celebrating his heroic victory against the rebels. Everyone cheers and parties, while some are still cautious of him. Crucifer, as always, just watches everything unfold. Meanwhile, to get everyone to loosen up, the headmistress thought of conducting a competition. Whereas the first one who gets the contract from Lux until 2 in the afternoon will have the privilege of having him for a week. Before Lux can even react to anything, he sees himself chased by the girls. Why are you doing this? He asks the headmistress as he runs away. Lux decides to hide in the machine repair cabin. Leisha allows him to, as she asks for some necessary details about Bahamut for research purposes. However, it is just a trick to catch Lux with Tiamat. Lux accepts defeat and tells Leisha to put him down, so he can hand over the contract. But it's actually his escape plan! And he go yeets! For now, Lux decides to hide behind the bushes, but fee -chan quickly sees him. The headmistress tells Fee that if she catches Lux, she will give her cake. Wow. Seriously. That's your motivation, <laughs> That's... Oh, I love this girl. She holds Lux until he cannot move. Now they can eat cake together. So as she holds onto Lux, the contract falls from his coat. As soon as Fee reaches for it, Lux seizes it and runs away. He tells her that they can eat cake some other time. The mention of cake seems to distract Fee from chasing him. After a couple more minutes of running and trying to find the best place to hide, Lux decides to stay in a certain room until the bell rings. However, some of the squadron members enter the chamber. They talk about what a pity it is that they didn't catch Lux, but they have to do a test ride as the dragons are repaired. It's too late when Lux realizes the room is actually a changing room. He already has a reputation for peeping and does not want to add more to these accusations. We can safely say that he might not beat the allegations if he stays there, obviously. Unfortunately, the book they are looking for is just right where he is hiding. Crucifer grabs the book and notices Lux by the corner. Lux knows this is his end, but Crucifer just tells her classmate that she won't be coming to practice. And as soon as the others head out, Crucifer tells Lux that it's okay to reveal himself now. She also points out that it's already 5 minutes past 2, so Lux has nothing to worry about since the time limit is over. Lux sighs in relief, while Crucifer asks to see the contract. As soon as Crucifer holds the contract, the bell rings. Apparently, Lux got tricked by Crucifer simply adjusting the hands of the clock, making him believe that the game is finished. Jeez. Wow, Crucifer. Good game. Well played. Well played. Lux cannot do anything but oblige as that is the rule. Closely, Crucifer whispers to him that she wants Lux to be her lover for the whole week. That night, the headmistress calls upon Lux and Irie. She shows them the whistle used by Ragreed to control the abysses. With that, the headmistress wants to send Lux on a mission, to confirm if that whistle is a key to the ruins as soon as the squadron heads out for a mission. Before parting ways, Irie reminds Lux to be cautious of this lover's request with Crucifer. Aside from being a foreign student from the Emir theocracy, there's something off about Crucifer, and Irie thinks she is hiding something. The next day, Crucifer reveals the reason for her request to Lux, while everyone is eager to eavesdrop. A family butler will visit her in a few days to ask about her engagement progress. She apparently is being forced to marry someone, but she doesn't have time for that as her personal goals are more important. Lux just has to deceive the butler into thinking that he and Crucifer have something genuine going on. The fake dating trope. Nice. Lux is hesitant about this since he has no relationship experience, so it might be better if she just looks for someone else. Crucifer asks him to come closer, to which of course the crowd goes wild! She then gently whispers to Lux's ears that if he does not do what he is asked, she will reveal his peeping adventure in the changing quarters. Oh, blackmail I see. Meanwhile, Leisha is not having the time of her life as she's once again is jealous. Green is not really a good color on you, princess, so 
you'll have your chance, don't worry. While studying in the common room that night, Leisha, Fee, and Tilfer interrupt Lux and Crucifer. She tells them to go to bed as it's late, especially Lux. When Crucifer announces that she'll go to bed, Leisha tells her to stay. Then she innocently boasts that she has held hands with Lux before. Huh? Okay... Well, it really shows her deep relationship with Lux, I guess. Alright. Lux then asks Leisha if she knows what a kiss is. Then Leisha defensively replies, Yes, it is something you have to do when you get married and if you want to have ba babies. Huh? V quietly says that she kissed Lux when they were kids, which makes Lux cover her mouth. Thankfully, nobody heard that. Crucifer then asks Lux to get some rest, as they have a date tomorrow. Well, he can guess who screams breaks the silence. Mm -hmm. The next day comes, and Lux and Crucifer go on their date while Fee and Leisha spy on them. They go clothes shopping, or well, Crucifer buys him new clothes. After shopping, they decide to eat dinner before returning to the academy. As they're walking, Crucifer teases, or flirts with, Lux, saying that he's cute and all. It's like an ordinary fake date until a group of armed men corners them. Crucifer asks Lux to become a diversion while she unleashes her machine. Lux does as he is told, and Crucifer takes her time to summon her dragon machine, Fafnir. Crucifer wastes no time as she targets the three other men left for her to fight. She shoots three of them with just a single blow with Fafnir's divine raiment, Wise Blood. Lux is amazed by this, while Leisha informs him of the Fafnir's ability to predict the future. Lux then asks Leisha what they're doing here, and why are they in disguise? But Leisha just goes on with her defensive mode. One of the men then tries to run away, but a woman stops him effortlessly. Apparently, this woman is Altariz, House Ainfolk's butler, who comes to check up on Crucifer, aka the one they have to fool. Good luck with that, Lux, cause she just took down a guy with a chokehold. Now in the restaurant, Crucifer introduces Lux as her boyfriend. This is fun and all, but the thing is, their conversation is interrupted by Lord Valzeride, one of the great four houses. But then Altariz reminds him that the dinner is tomorrow. Well, this guy knows. He just can't wait to see his future wife. He then joins them and introduces himself to Curlsifer by holding her by the chin. Like, excuse me, sir? Excuse me. He then tells her that she's as beautiful as they say, a bit on the thinner side, but he'll enjoy seeing her mature. Ugh. Excuse me! Unfortunately for Bowsy Boy, as he can plainly see, she's in a relationship with another man. Hello, it's this cutie with Lux, to be precise. Bowsy knows him. He tells Crucifer that his and Lux's status greatly differ. Is that really the case? Crucifer asks. When then asked to repeat herself, she tells Bowsy here that first of all, he could stop calling her his future wife, as they're still strangers. And quite offended by this, Balzi, I mean Balzaride, dares Lux in on one on one combat to determine who is the strongest, as he is confident with his skills are beyond Lux. Crucifer interjects that he should make it a two on two battle. He can pair up with Altaris. Poor Butler getting swept by her lady's shenanigans. Oh well. Balzaride agrees with this, while Lux accepts the challenge. Three nights from now, the battle of the strongest will take place. Lord Balzaride might just be the warrior who will strip Lux of his title as the undefeated weakest, but Lux has already gone through so much. Regardless of how this will turn out, all he can do is maintain his steadfast and unwavering attitude to keep putting one foot forward at a time. To continue his chronicle of the undefeated. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.